Hello, this is Tony Heller from RealClimateScience.com, setting the record straight about climate. In this video, I'm going to show that there is no climate crisis, there is no ocean acidification crisis, and that the Extinction Rebellion is based on junk science and superstition. The Washington Post has a motto, Democracy Dies in Darkness, carefully placed on a black background. They believe that the world is going to end in less than 12 years due to a one part per 10,000 increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide over the past century. The New York Times apparently agrees and says that everybody needs to panic. It takes about 10 seconds to demonstrate that this is anti-science nonsense, but this video is going to be quite a bit longer than that. In order to understand what higher levels of CO2 do to the climate and do to life on Earth, all we need to do is go back in time and see what life was like when CO2 levels were much higher. CO2 levels on Earth reached a peak 540 million years ago during the Cambrian era. Atmospheric CO2 is more than 15 times higher than it is at present. And let's look at what happened to Earth at that time. The biggest explosion of life in Earth's history occurred with CO2 levels at their peak. Corals and shellfish evolved when CO2 levels are more than 15 times higher than they are now. If ocean acidification was an actual problem, the oceans would have been dead rather than exploding with life. The whole idea of the Extinction Rebellion is based around trivial to disprove nonsense. And you might ask why peer-reviewed academics haven't picked up on this very basic fact. NASA has found that over the past 35 years, Earth has gotten much greener. And this is due to higher levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Earth has massive coal beds, which climate alarmists are terrified of. The reason we have these coal beds is because at the beginning of the Carboniferous era, CO2 levels were very high. This caused very verdant vegetation to grow on Earth. And when these plants died, they formed very thick peat beds. These peat beds got buried and turned into coal. The reason we use coal as a fuel is because it contains huge amounts of stored solar energy from millions of years ago. These plants captured solar energy through the magic of photosynthesis. Coal beds contain tens of millions of years worth of stored solar energy. And a few hundred years ago, clever humans learned how to get the stored solar energy back by burning coal. The sudden availability of energy lifted humanity out of squalor and made life better for everyone. Fossil fuels are one of the greatest blessings which humanity has been given. Now let's look at the increase in carbon dioxide emissions over the past century. There's been a huge increase in emissions from coal, oil, and natural gas. According to climate alarmists, this huge increase in CO2 emissions should have caused all kinds of bad things to happen. Let's see if they actually occurred. First, let's look at crop yields. You can see that as CO2 emissions increased, so did long-term wheat yields in Europe. This increase in crop yields was due largely to a couple of factors. One was that increased levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere makes plants grow faster. That's why commercial greenhouse operators pump up the levels of carbon dioxide inside their greenhouses, because they want their plants to grow faster. The other factor is that the availability of fossil fuels has allowed us to develop equipment and machinery, which also increases productivity. And it's the same story with corn yields in the United States. As CO2 increased, so did corn yields. And the same story in the Southern Hemisphere. As atmospheric CO2 increases, so does plant growth. Now let's look at hunger. Climate alarmists and many academics in general have long been predicting huge famines, but the exact opposite is occurring. Earth has far fewer hungry people than it did just 30 years ago. Another benefit is that poverty is way down. Our fossil fuel powered infrastructure has made it possible for many people to lift themselves out of poverty. The availability of low cost communications, heat, light, and transportation has been a tremendous benefit to the human race. Illiteracy has plummeted as carbon dioxide levels have increased. Our fossil fuel powered internet is a huge help to billions of people around the world. Human life expectancy has nearly doubled as CO2 levels have increased. Now here's a really interesting statistic. 
global natural disaster death rates have plummeted as CO2 has increased. This is the exact opposite of what climate alarmists are telling people. Every time we get a natural disaster now, climate alarmists immediately blame it on global warming or climate change. But that, like almost everything else they believe about climate, is superstition, not science. I've already shown enough material to completely debunk the climate crisis nonsense. But I'm having fun and I'm going to continue deconstructing their ridiculous claims. Here's an article from the Washington Post a few years ago. Seas are now rising faster than they have in 2,800 years, scientists say. Whenever you see the word scientists say in a newspaper article, you can be pretty sure that you're about to read a bunch of complete nonsense. The 1990 IPCC report said the exact opposite. They said there was no convincing evidence of an acceleration in global sea level rise during the 20th century. And if we look at long-term tide gauges, we can see why the IPCC said that in their 1990 report. This is the tide gauge from Lower Manhattan. You can see that the trend is linear. The rate of sea level rise is the same now as it was when Abraham Lincoln was president. Sea level is rising at the same rate now as it was 30 years ago, 60 years ago, 90 years ago, 100 years ago, 150 years ago. If there was an acceleration in sea level rise, we would see an upwards curvature. This upwards curvature does not exist, however, so we know there has been no acceleration in sea level rise rates. And we see the same story in Florida. There's been no upwards curvature. Sea level is rising at the same rate at Key West as it was 100 years ago. In Sweden, sea level actually appears to be falling. This is due to the fact that the land in Sweden is rising. But the key point, once again, is that there's been no upwards curvature which we would see if sea level rise rates were accelerating. And a brand new paper confirms what I'm saying. This was just published in June. It says, sea level rise by thermal expansion is likely less than 0.7 millimeters per year. Subsidence, or land sinking, is the main contributor of sea level rise in many areas of the world. Then the article goes on to say that the empirical evidence for an acceleration in sea level rise is missing. All of the long-term tide gauges of the world consistently show a negligible acceleration since the time they started recording in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Hence, the state of the oceans cannot be described as sharply warming and accelerating since 1870, and there is yet no sign of the climate models predicted sharply warming accelerating sea level rise. So the claims of accelerating sea level rise are based on propaganda and misinformation not science. If we go back further to the end of the last ice age 20,000 years ago, we can see that sea level has risen about 400 feet. Most of this rapid rise occurred between 14,000 years ago and 8,000 years ago, and over the past 8,000 years, sea level rise has been very slow. Climate alarmists want you to believe that this 400 feet of sea level rise was all natural, but the last few inches were man-made. This is utterly ridiculous nonsense. Just like with their temperature data, in recent years NASA has altered their sea level data. NASA's James Hansen started the global warming scare before Congress in 1988. But in 1982, he published a paper showing that sea level rise nearly stopped after the year 1950. That's the black line here. However, NASA has since changed their data. The red line is NASA's new data. They've completely erased the sea level rise hiatus from 1950 to 1970. They created this fake data because they want people to believe that the Arctic is melting down and that cities are going to drown. So now let's look at the Arctic. Starting a little over 10 years ago, experts started predicting the immediate demise of Arctic sea ice. 2008, expert Arctic polar cat may disappear this summer. National Geographic News, June 20th, 2008. North Pole may be ice-free for first time this summer. BBC, August 2008. Swimmer aims to kayak to North Pole. This year, for the first time, scientists predict that the North Pole could briefly be ice-free, and that has inspired Mr. Pugh to try to find a way through. Mr. Pugh made it about 20 miles out of Svalbard before he got blocked by ice and had to turn around and go back. 
Well, the 2008 forecast didn't work out, so they changed it to 2012. Could all Arctic ice be gone by 2012? By Seth Borenstein, Associated Press. The Arctic is screaming, said Mark Cerise, senior scientist at the government's Snow and Ice Data Center in Boulder, Colorado. This week, after reviewing his own new data, NASA climate scientist Jay Zwally said, at this rate, the Arctic could be nearly ice-free by the end of summer 2012. Here is the same story from National Geographic. Arctic sea ice gone in summer within five years. The BBC was a little more conservative. They said the Arctic wasn't going to be ice-free until 2013. In the end, it will just melt away quite suddenly, Professor Peter Wadhams of Cambridge University. Nobel laureate Al Gore was even more conservative. He said the Arctic wasn't going to be ice-free until 2014. And NASA's James Hansen was the most conservative of all. He said the Arctic wouldn't be ice-free until maybe 2018, last year. Representative Ed Markey, Democrat Massachusetts committee chairman, said, Dr. Hansen was right. 20 years later, we recognize him as a climate prophet. The Sierra Club believes the Arctic has been ice-free for six years. The Guardian believes that the Arctic has been ice-free for four years. Journalist Mark Hartsgard also believes that the Arctic has been ice-free for four years. Professor Peter Wadhams from Cambridge didn't do too well with his 2012 prediction, so he later pushed it back to 2017 or 2018. So now let's look at what Arctic sea ice has actually done in the past 12 years since experts started making their silly predictions. This is the official government data from the Multi-Agency Sea Ice Index. The blue line shows Arctic sea ice extent every single day since the beginning of 2006. As you can see, Arctic sea ice extent increases during the winter and decreases during the summer. It does this every single year. The red line is the 365-day mean. As you can see looking at the red line, there's been essentially no change in Arctic sea ice extent over the past 12 years. In other words, these experts making their forecasts of Arctic sea ice demise had absolutely no clue what they were talking about. Now let's move away from the seas and look at the ice which is covering Greenland. There was lots of propaganda last year about how Greenland was melting down and falling apart. This is a compilation of graphs from the Danish Meteorological Institute showing Greenland ice over the past few years. This is the graph of the surface mass balance in billions of tons of ice. It shows the difference in weight between snow accumulating on the surface and melting off of the surface of Greenland. In an average year, Greenland gains a little less than 400 billion tons of ice on its surface every year. Last year, the gain was much less than average. Greenland's surface only gained about 160 billion tons of ice. But last year was well within the normal range shown by the gray band. However, what the press didn't talk about was that during the previous two years, surface mass balance gain was well above normal in Greenland. During both 2017 and 2018, Greenland's surface gained more than 500 billion tons of ice. These are inconvenient facts which the press doesn't want the public to hear about and they refuse to report on. Now let's move on to the hurricane nonsense being propagated by the press. Three years ago, the United States was in a record hurricane drought. The United States had not been hit by a major hurricane in more than 10 years. That's the only time this has ever happened. The Washington Post said they were terrified by the unprecedented hurricane drought. They said, a major hurricane hasn't hit the U.S. Gulf or East Coast in more than a decade. A major hurricane is one containing maximum sustained winds of at least 111 miles per hour and classified as Category 3 or higher on the 1 to 5 Saphir Simpson wind scale. Hurricane Sandy had transitioned to a post-tropical storm when it struck New Jersey in 2012 and was no longer classified as a hurricane at landfall though it had winds equivalent to a Category 1 storm. The streak has reached 3,937 days, longer than any previous drought by nearly two years. And this made the Washington Post terrified. But then when we finally did get a major hurricane in 2018, the Washington Post, of course, blamed it on Donald Trump. This map shows all of the tropical cyclone tracks in the Atlantic since 1851. 
It would be nice if the Washington Post could point out which ones exactly were Trump's fault. And this is the same map for the whole planet. One of these storms has got to be President Trump's fault. The Washington Post has taken us back to Dark Ages levels of superstition. If we look at the official data from NOAA, we can see that there's been a sharp decline in U.S. landfalling hurricanes since the 19th century. They peaked in 1886 when the United States was hit by an incredible seven hurricanes. And major hurricanes have dropped off sharply in the U.S. since the 1950s. The blue line in this graph is the 10-year centered mean of the number of major hurricanes making landfall in the United States. The recent 10-year stretch with no major hurricanes was completely unprecedented. There is zero evidence to suggest that hurricanes are getting worse in the United States, much less Donald Trump's fault. Now let's go back 30 years and look at some of James Hansen's predictions when he started the global warming scare before Congress. If you like last summer's record temperatures, you're going to love the 1990s as James Hansen, the NASA scientist who during congressional hearings on the Midwestern drought went greenhouse warming to the heat wave. Washington, D.C., for instance, would go from its current 35 days a year over 90 degrees to 85 days a year. The level of the oceans will rise anywhere from 1 to 6 feet. Let's see how Hansen did with that forecast. This graph shows the number of 90 degree days in Lincoln, Virginia, which is the closest United States Historical Climatology Network station in Virginia to Washington, D.C. Well, the number of 90 degree days in the Washington, D.C. area has plummeted since the peak in 1930. It's way down. Dr. Hansen got his forecast exactly wrong. And the National Climate Assessment shows exactly the same thing for the entire United States. Heat waves peaked in the 1930s and have plummeted since then. Once again, Dr. Hansen had no clue what he was talking about. Also in 1988, Dr. Hansen predicted a huge increase in drought and massive hurricanes. Let's see how Hansen did with that forecast. This red circle shows when Hansen gave his testimony in 1988. The green line is U.S. precipitation, which you can see has been increasing since the start of records in the late 19th century. This year has been the wettest on record. Hansen gave his testimony during a drought, which hasn't been repeated since then. And over the last 10 years, it's been the wettest 10 years on record in the United States. Once again, Hansen got everything exactly backwards. Now let's look at Hansen's forecast for ferocious storms. This was a list which the National Hurricane Center put together in 1996, showing the 35 deadliest Atlantic tropical cyclones. Since then, there's been two very large hurricanes which would have to be added to the list. This was Hurricane Mitch in 1998 and Hurricane Katrina in 2006. If we include those two hurricanes in the list, we can still see that nearly one-fourth of the deadliest hurricanes which occurred in the Atlantic occurred during the years 1767 to 1782. That 15-year period was during the Little Ice Age. Obviously, global warming and carbon dioxide has nothing to do with extremely large hurricanes. The deadliest Atlantic hurricane occurred in the year 1780. It played a key role in the Revolutionary War and killed more than 20,000 people. Every single structure in Barbados was destroyed by this hurricane. Noah says that the wind speeds in this hurricane were over 200 miles per hour. The noise was so deafening that people could not hear their own voices. British Admiral Rodney wrote that the wind carried aloft 100 foot the heavy cannons of the ground fortifications. No trees or houses were left standing. The wind blew so strong that it stripped the bark off the trees. If we had a storm like the 1780 hurricane again, climate scientists would say they were 100% certain it was due to higher levels of CO2 and couldn't possibly have happened in the past. Now let's look at Hansen's forecast for global warming. Hansen made forecasts for three different scenarios. Scenario A was the most rapid rise in global temperatures. He called that business as usual. Then he had scenario B and scenario C, which meant that we completely stopped using fossil fuels. On top of Hansen's black and white graph, I've superimposed in red lower troposphere temperatures as measured from satellites. You can see that they're tracking scenario C very closely. 
Remember that scenario C was the case where we stopped using fossil fuels. In other words, temperatures are exactly the same now as they would have been if we would have quit using fossil fuels 20 years ago. The whole global warming story is a complete farce. So how did James Hansen respond to his incredible list of failures? Well, he simply patted himself on the back and told the world about what a great job he did. Hansen's climate models didn't work, so he did what has become standard practice in climate science. He simply altered his data to make it look like the data was corresponding to his models. This animation alternates between the 1999 version of NASA U.S. temperatures in black and the 2019 version in red. In the 1999 version, the warmest year in the U.S. was 1934, in 1998 was about half a degree centigrade cooler, but in the current version they reversed them. Hansen has erased the heat of the 1930s, made the past much cooler, and made the present much warmer. In doing so, he turned a long-term cooling trend into a long-term warming trend. As I mentioned, this sort of data tampering and fraud has become standard practice of government agencies. The blue line shows measured U.S. temperatures from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and the red line shows the graphs which they released to the public. As you can see, they massively cool the past and warm the present to create the appearance of a warming trend which doesn't actually exist in the data. And they've published all kinds of excuses for why they're doing this data tampering, all of which I've shown to be wildly exaggerated or completely false. But I think the biggest part of the scam is them claiming that they can do something about atmospheric CO2 levels. Governments have made all kinds of climate agreements in the past, none of which have had any impact on atmospheric CO2 levels, which continue to rise exponentially. There is no climate crisis. This is just one more popular delusion and madness of crowds, as Charles Mackey wrote about in 1841. Men, it has been well said, think in herds, and we've seen that they go mad in herds, while they only recover their senses slowly and one by one. It's incredible to me that anyone continues to read the Washington Post after they publish this sort of garbage. They want to shut down the U.S. energy supply, and then they say democracy dies in darkness. Perhaps that's what they're trying to create. Visit Toto on the web at realclimatescience.com. He's been pulling back the curtain on junk science and propaganda for a long time.